larger than life figure, but he really has a reputation throughout the country, in the Midwest, on the West Coast, everywhere, as really one of the great human beings in our profession. And when I came here 12 years ago, we became good friends. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking together, and talking about different things, and, and uh, there's nobody in this town that I have more respect for and would consider a better friend than Roger. So being here tonight to honor him is a true thrill for me, I can assure you. The other thing we know, Roger, we don't know about Roger, but I can verify about Roger is what a great fisherman he is. <laughs> right, Rog? I can't, you can't deny this now. Okay, so one day Roger and Ron Maestri and I go out fishing together. Ron Maestri, of course, the great coach from the University of New Orleans, and Gary Risponi took us out. And, you know, we're going to have a little competition. There was a little <laughs> bit of trash talking prior to us getting on that boat, I have to admit. So I think they call it the bow. I'm up at the front. Is that what the bow is? Okay, so I'm on the bow of the boat, and I'm casting, and I'm telling my arms getting tired. I'm throwing about 15 lines into the water. I can't get a nibble. And there's Roger at the back of the boat along with Ron Macy, and I swear every time they're throwing the line in, they're pulling a speckled trout back up. And I'm thinking it has to do something with where I'm standing on the boat, but they won't let me get back with them. You stay up there. So finally, what happened, Raj? You caught the biggest fish ever. That's right. And I thought it was like a, a sea monster coming out of the water. I've never seen anything like that. So I told Roger and Mace, you guys just keep hitting those singles in the back. I went right away for the grand slam. I'm done for the day. But it, it just goes to show, you know, what a great friend Roger is and uh, how much fun we could have together. Uh, we both outdid Main Street, there's no question about that. Especially since he's not here, we can say that, right, Roger? You know, uh, um, when I first got here, uh, Roger called me up and he said, you know, uh, he said, LSU has not been over to play on the bluff in several years. And uh, I would like for you to bring the LSU team over to the bluff. So the very first schedule that I put together, which was the second season I was here, we went over out of respect for Roger to play our very first game there. And uh, I'll tell you, they, I, I couldn't believe just how hard that Southern team played, how great they played. They had us on the run for most of the game. We started Lewis Coleman, a major league pitcher, and they, they, they rocked him in the first two innings. We had to take him out of the game. It was a great ball game, and it really was typical of every game that we played against Southern. I can remember in 2009, Roger, I know this was a tough one for you, but we won the national championship that year, and that first game of the regional, we played Southern University. And you threw a little kid by the name of Chase Richard, do you remember? And we were down two to nothing in the seventh inning until your outstanding catcher, Michael Thomas, threw a ball into left field when we tried to steal base and it gave us our first run. We had to pitch out of a bases loaded jam in the seventh inning. I mean, finally, we were able to squeak by, and we went on to win the national championship. And yet, the toughest game we had in the entire NCAA tournament was against Southern University. Rogers teams always played with great passion. They played with great hustle. They were extremely well coached. I will always remember just how tough a games we always had with Southern University, and I attribute it not only to great ball players, but the outstanding coaching of that ball club. You know, uh, I grew up the son. Yes, that's right. I grew up the son of a uh, college baseball coach. When my father retired from coaching after a 30-year career at Miami-Dade Community College, he was generally regarded as the greatest junior college coach in history. And when I was a young man of about 14, I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. If I could not be a major league baseball player, I wanted to be a college baseball coach. And I went to my father and I told him that. And I said, I said, Pop, I, I, I know what I want to do, and I want to be a coach like you. And he said to me, he said, listen, if you want to be a coach, you have to do it for the right reasons. And I said, okay, Pop, what are the right reasons? He said, you have to do it for one reason. The main reason is to help nurture young people that are entrusted to you and teach them that what it takes to be successful today on a baseball field later on in life is going to teach them 
how to be successful in any endeavor that they so choose. That has been my guiding light my entire coaching career, is the focus has always been on the players and how you can help them grow. When you go around the country and you meet other coaches, like Roger Cador and several others, you realize that those, those men receive that message loud and clear early in their lives as well. I'm sure Roger, if he was standing here instead of me telling you, is that you feel like it's a calling, that this is your way to contribute to society. This is your way to impact young people's lives. And I can tell you, I've watched, not from a far distance, from a fairly close distance, and seen the impact that Roger has had on his players throughout his career. And I can tell you this because we have employed several Southern University ball players at our summer camp every summer. They are the hardest working, most reliable, most dedicated kids that we ever have working in our summer camp. And I think that's just a reflection on the leadership of right. the Southern University baseball program for all these years that has been Roger Cater, and I know that Carrick Jackson is going to continue the great work that Roger began. Those kids, I have the greatest respect for them because of the way that they conduct themselves. You know, uh, in our society nowadays, we have a lot of issues. There's a, you know, our world is not a, a, a uh, it's not clicking on all cylinders, I guess is the way to say it. You know, the people, people are different. We have different color skin, we have different levels of wealth, we have different beliefs and politics, we have all, all kinds of issues are going on out there. The one place that I see all the time that we don't have those problems is on the athletic field. When I first met Roger and, and we played a game, I never saw Roger as a black man coaching a baseball team. I just saw him simply as a man coaching a baseball team doing the same thing that I did. It, it's so wonderful when you go out there on the field and you just have respect for the other person. You know, the great Martin Luther King was sending the message to us loud and clear. Judge somebody by their character. Don't judge them by the way that they look. And I think that the Southern University baseball program and most of the people that I've ever met from Southern University have been some of the wonder, most wonderful people I've met in my life. And, and I hope when they look at me, they don't see a white person, they just see a person of character and a person that wants to be their friend and wants to be somebody that can help whenever they can. And I think if more people in our world, in our society, would think the way that Roger and I think about each other, then I think our world would be a much better place. And this is where it begins with the leadership of our different universities, of different places throughout the country. You know, I love Roger, and I hope that he has respect for me, and I think that what he has done throughout his career has made our world a much better place. Yes. You know, when I give speeches very frequently around uh, the country and in this community, I often talk about one of my sports heroes when I was a young man. Uh, I don't know why, but I, I just always had the greatest respect for one of the greatest tennis players that ever played, and that was Mr. Arthur Ashe. Yeah. And I'm sure many of you will remember what a phenomenal tennis player he was. And what I remember the most about Roger, when I was, I was just a young man, a teenager, I mean, excuse me, about Arthur Ashe, when I was a young man, what I remembered about him was the class and the dignity that he always performed. And that he, he just lived a wonderful life and he was great to everybody. And, and I'm sure that it was a very difficult time in the 60s and 70s when he was playing. I can't remember exactly what year he finished playing, but I know that it was a difficult time. And what he endured, no man should ever have to, I'm sure. But you never would have known it because he handled himself with such grace and dignity. And I followed him very closely. He was my favorite tennis player that I would follow. And then I think most of you probably know the story of what happened to Arthur Ashe. Uh, he had surgery for, for a physical ailment. And while he had a blood transfusion, he was given the HIV virus and eventually he ended up dying of AIDS. 
But I remember one of his late last interviews he ever gave, and I remember it like it was yesterday and it's been 40 years. The reporter asked him, Arthur, you are one of the most respected people in our country in athletics. You have lived an exemplary life. Have you ever sat back and asked, why me? Why would I get such a bad break as what happened to you? Have you ever asked that of yourself? And I'll never forget his answer as long as I live. It was a very simple answer and he said, if I was to ask why me when the bad things happened to me, then I should have been asking why me when I had all the good things in life. And I, I share that story with my players all the time. I share it with every audience I think I've ever spoken to. If everybody would realize just how fortunate we are to have the friendships that we have, to have the opportunities, to have the health that we have, to be able to gather in a wonderful country, especially while we're here on Veterans Day weekend, to know that people out there have given us this ability to enjoy each other's company. People like Arthur Ashe will continue to live in my thoughts, at my admiration, and it's something that inspires me to share with other people. Roger, I, I am so proud of the career that you have had, and you have impacted so many lives, okay? And I'm not trying to end yours anytime soon, but I want to read, I want to read a poem to everybody here that's my favorite poem because I think it's very appropriate as we talk about you on your retirement. So if you just bear with me for a second here. Unfortunately, I gotta pull out the old, cheat, uh, the old uh, cheaters. There's a poem called The Dash, you may have heard it. It's from a lady by the name of Linda Ellis. And I want you to listen to these words because I think they really are appropriate. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He, refer he referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the following day with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between the years. For the dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth and now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live in love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are, these, are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way that other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read and your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? I thought about that today, Raj, because, again, I hope you live for another 50 years, okay? But I think when you think, when we talk about your dash and the impact that you have made on so many young men, on a community, on your friends and the people that have admired you, I can think of no one who has a greater dash than you. And I'm so honored to be here tonight to speak about my friend, I did at the uh, moment of his retirement, okay? Roger, I know you didn't want me to tell you, say this, but I want you all to know that we're going to honor Roger before we play Southern this year out at LSU, and we're gonna do it in the most appropriate way, not only because he's a great baseball coach, but because he's a great ambassador right. for our community. He brings people together, which is what I wish everybody would do, that we could live together in, in harmony and, and, and have great respect for each other. But I, I just want everybody to know that I think the world of this man, I think the world of Southern University, that band today just put chills up my spine. What a great way for you to be honored, Roger. And I just have great respect for the Southern University, for the baseball program. Carrick, I wish you the very best in every game this year, except for one, of course. <laughs> but I'll be your biggest fan. I know you have a big shadow 
to, 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 to work under. I kind of know that feeling, if you know what I mean. Okay? We, uh, but you'll make it, and you'll do it.